we have been going through the journey we have been learning about the characters from the bible very lately we have been seeing the characters especially during the time of babylonian captivity starting from daniel isaiah jeremiah so in that series today we will look at ezekiel all these characters if you look at it in a way it leads us in the road that leads to jesus christ we saw how gospel was revealed in daniel isaiah and how jeremiah dealt with that situation also we saw lamentations and today it's going to be ezekiel we will see the message is simple the message that ezekiel gave us simple repent and live god's longing for his children to turn towards him you can go to the next slide you can see there call it gospel according to ezekiel that's a message which he gave repent and live we are living in an uncertain world but one thing is for certain death death is for certain death leads to eternity either in hell or heaven the question is which section you are going to choose smoking or non smoking right turn heart of god is pleading us through ezekiel turn 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 there are three times he used in a verse we will see a little later the book of ezekiel is named after the author as you see in the screen if you could yehes 12 yehes 12 meaning god strengthens our god of strength our god is strong at the age of 25 ezekiel was deported to babylon during the second captivity which is around 597 bc we saw during the time jeremiah was in jerusalem at the same time pretty much ezekiel was in babylon and throughout these characters when we were studying we are, we all know that there were three deportations when king nebuchadnezzar from babylon we came to judah first one was 607 bc that's when he took daniel and the elites all the royal people from the palace and the second one was 597 bc that's when we see ezekiel was taken along with the king the jehoiachin and the third besiege pretty much he he captured jerusalem and destroyed the temple all of these books what we saw dealt with that captivity and the destruction of jerusalem and all the pain and suffering the people went through by the time ezekiel went to babylon in 597 daniel was already there he was there for 9 years ezekiel mentions daniel 3 times but we don't see daniel mentioning ezekiel possibly daniel was in in the administration of the government ezekiel was born into a priestly family he is a levite as a levite at, at the age of 30 they start doing their work but unfortunately this is when we see here at the age of 25 he was deported Ezekiel is going to prophesy 22 years in Babylon and he was very discouraged because of you now he has become a refugee and also he has become a captive uh, also we see him as a priest they are supposed to start their priestly work which they have been waiting for and they couldn't he could not do that 
And book of Ezekiel is somewhat mystical. They say it is an enigma, meaning it is beyond understanding. In other words, it, it baffles the mind. Because of this, Jewish rabbis prohibited men under the age of 30 to read. I would call it maybe PG-30. Maybe I got qualified lately to read and potentially give this message for you. Why is it baffling our mind? Let me read a few things, because a lot of things are unique in Ezekiel, and some of them are rarely used elsewhere. Ezekiel's bread, healing trees with leaves for medicine, UFOs are aliens. There are 14% of Americans, they still believe in UFOs, and some of these group, they quote verses from Ezekiel. What were the wheels in Ezekiel? We saw him reading during the Bible reading time. Are the wheels in Ezekiel some kind of alien spaceship which Ezekiel saw? Or who are those angelic beings called cherubim mentioned in 24 times? Moving vehicles, flashing lights, loud rumbling sound, sound of the wheels, ice on the rims. Are these self-driving? What are the ophanim? What are the wheels within wheels? Gyroscope. Dead bones walking. What does the valley of dry bone mean? What does it mean to stand in the gap? Whirlwind, mentioned 14 times, me, related to the judgment. He was tied with rope, tongue stuck in his mouth, using tablet, playing war game. Embroidered clothes, jewelries like nose rings. We don't see it elsewhere. Water, Ohola, water, Oholiba. Water, Gog and Magog. When will Gog and Magog attempt to destroy Israel? What, is the mo what are the modern nations represent Gog and Magog? And NKJV or NKJV seems to hint that Satan was involved with the music in heaven. That's the only insight we have. And Lucifer. We see some insight from Ezekiel 28, 17. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. Satan is beautiful. In Ezekiel, we find Satan was created as a perfect, wise, and beautiful angel. How should Christians react to the death of evil people? Answer is in Ezekiel. Eating the scroll. Message was bitter. Watchman. Who was Thomas in the Bible? You know, Thomas was related with spring break. It's starting tomorrow, right? Thomas was somehow related with spring break. Tel Aviv, where is Tel Aviv in the Bible? It's in Ezekiel. And Bible says, in Ezekiel it says, God says, do not quote this verb. Do not quote this proverb. And we saw in the pre-service video, Ezekiel did a lot of sign acts. A number of Ezekiel's oracles consisted of dramatic performances. Some in, they call it a pantomime, mime. Some using limited props in order to act out a message. Ezekiel was involved in some kind of bizarre actions or behavior, such as lying on his side for 390 days and, you know, and, and on his right side for 40 days. And also, God appointed him as a watchman. And all his prophecies point forward to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And we will see a little bit of the overview in, you know, in a bit. And when, he's, when, when I say, go back to the first slide. Thank you. We haven't gone there yet. Go back. I, 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 you know, if you see here, repent and live, Rep repent and live, and we see here in Old Testament, you know how New Testament John the Baptist started his ministry? Repent and believe. Let's bow down and pray 
so that God will teach us these baffling things as we go through the message today. Heavenly Father, you are God of strength. You are strong. Help us, Lord, today. Give us that strength. As we go through the message, and some of them are really tough, some of them we may not understand. Be with us, Lord. Speak to us. As Ezekiel come to you, came to you, Lord, you told him, stand up, son of man. Listen. Help us to listen to you today, the words which you spoke through Ezekiel that will help in our lives. Help us, Lord, to understand. I ask in Jesus' name. Let us start with a quick overview. There are 48 chapters in Ezekiel. The first section is personal. First three chapters you can see. Now, uh, you know, I will give you a very high level. You know, it's more of a, like a personal call. The second section is national. That is 4 to 24 about the is nation of Israel. Then the third section is international. The, the nation surrounding Israel. You know, similar to how Jeremiah presented his book. And the fourth section is eschatological and more of a, you know, what you call eventually what will happen, you know, during the end time. Ezekiel was a priest and actually he served as a prophet because the temple was destroyed and, and no work for a priest. He prophesied near and, and prophesied far. That's what you see there. When you say near prophecy, he was, he was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which the people saw during his time. And the far prophecy, if you see there, there are three different sections. You know, one is a re-establishment of Jerusalem, that is 37. Then the Battle of Armageddon, 38 to 39. Then the last section is you know, uh, the Millennial Age and the Millennial Temple, which, is, which will be rebuilt. There are many similarities between this book and the book of uh, Revelation. Ezekiel has a vision of the throne of God in chapter 1. That's what we heard during the time of Bible reading. John has a vision of the throne of God in the book of Revelation. Most, some of the things will be exactly the same. Ezekiel talks about Kog and Magog, which is a reference to re people believe maybe Russia. Revelation, Revelation speaks about Gog and Magog as well. Ezekiel sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Revelation speaks about a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Ezekiel speaks about waters of life, and so does John in the book of Revelation. We even had a Q&A one person. The dominant theme of the book of Ezekiel is the Lord saying, know that I am the Lord. This, this particular statement, know that I am the Lord, is 62 times in Ezekiel. Sometimes it will say, you may know that I am the Lord. Sometimes it may say, they may know that I am the Lord. That's a dominant theme that we know to him. We need to know him and God is longing for us to know him. This is God's desire for people to know him and God will go to the great lengths to reveal himself to us. So that people will not die in their sins. That's the theme. Jewish people have been in rebellion against God. They have been idolatrous. They have been worshipping foreign gods. And so God is allowing the Babylonians to come and, and, and get besieged. And they were in captivity for 70 years. And during that 70 years... Ezekiel was appointed as a prophet. At the same time, you, we saw last couple of sermons, especially Jeremiah was helping, prophesying in Judah. And uh, quickly, yeah, you can see the slide here. During the captivity, you know, the top section, it, it talks about those three, three different times they were taken. They have taken captive Daniel, you know, in exile 605. Then you can see uh, 597, then also, and you can see 587, three different times. And I given them, in the bottom, you can see that place where they left, that is from you know, Jerusalem to Babylon. It is around 750 miles as of today, 
but those time you now going around the river and all those things they say it, it may be around 1000 miles journey give you the picture going back going to dallas and coming back is around 6 what 700 miles right so you can calculate like by walk to dallas a couple of times so let's let's start our message from the first chapter a little bit of a glimpse of what we saw during the you know bible reading cs lewis put this way when he talks about uh, you know god's glory go to the next slide you can see here nature never taught me that there exist a god of glory and of infinite majesty i had to learn that in other ways but nature gave the word world word glory a meaning for me i still do not know where else i could have found one for cs lewis it was the nature was speaking to him to represent god's glory but here god himself gave to ezekiel the god's glory and you know it's mind boggling you know if you if, if you you know if you paid attention to that and the light and sound and everything and rainbow was my understanding rainbow was mentioned you know only a only one time after genesis that is in ezekiel when it was representing his glory and you see here that uh, the the wheel within wheel and we saw you no know, message version of uh, of the bible ezekiel it says like this brightness everywhere the way the rainbow springs out of the sky on a rainy day that's what it was like it turned out to be the glory of god when i when i saw all this i fell to my knees my face to the ground then i heard a voice that's how it ends in the chapter 1 that was ezekiel's description of god's throne in heaven we can't fully understand all he described and even he didn't understand that's what if you read the passage it will say it looked like it it looked something like that right so many places but under the inspiration of the holy spirit he attempted to give as the glimpse of god's glory around the throne of the eternal glorious god he saw a flashing sparkling spinning rainbow of brilliance how do we interpret such a mysterious language some you know strive to find meaning in every you know every aspect of ezekiel vision vision and there is a cult group in 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 in, in judaism they specifically formed their religion based out of uh, this particular ezekiel one blindly finding reason and 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 various things what we saw in ezekiel one and one thing you know some people take you know these four different faces which which ezekiel was representing in the in in four faces in the in the creature one of the creatures there they say these four four faces are four different gospels the lion refers to majesty of power majesty and power the man represents the intelligence and will that's ox the lion uh, the lion was you know for the majesty and power and uh, you can see here but yeah you can see the gospel of matthew is the gospel of the kingdom the kingdom is referred to you no know, more than any other book that that's a lion then we have gospel of mark we see jesus moving from place to place rapidly jesus as a servant servitude and the animal of servitude was the ox you see there then then became you no know, we see the gospel of luke which was written by a gentile doctor doctor especially you know, with the greeks in mind you know like representing the humanity and they were looking for the ideal man and so the term son of man in used frequently in luke and the last one is the gospel of john that represents the eagle who depicts a jesus as god the son god in human flesh the divine the deity of christ representing that so also you know it is very you know impossible to interpret the specifics definitely but we can understand that ezekiel's aim was to put the glory of heaven on display for us the wheels that moved in in concert in you know, a flashing light and sparkling jewels and brilliant light all all refers to the picture of god's glory 
Now we'll move to, now when we move to Ezekiel 2, this is how it starts. Stand up, son of man, said the voice. I want to speak with you. The spirit came into me as he spoke. And God gives, you know, a few more things. Then finally we see here, for remember, they are rebels. He's talking about Israelites. At least they will know they have had a prophet among them. And verse 8, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not join them in their rebellion. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then chapter 3, the wise said to me, son of man, eat what I am giving you. Eat this crawl, then go and give its message to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. Fill your stomach with this, he said, and, and when I ate it, it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. God gives you, you know, as you said, uh, as he, uh, you know, in the pre-service video we saw, right, Mo most of his act was like a sign act, right? Even God himself leading him through all these things. And literally he's eating the scroll, which is a bitter message, of judgment, and Ezekiel is saying that, you know, you know but the, fill your stomach, I mean, uh, God is saying, fill your stomach with this, he said, and when I ate it, tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. And we, in chapter 3, we, you know, we see here further, 316, after seven days, the Lord gave me the message, he said, Son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman for Israel. Whenever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. And verse 18, if I warn the wicked saying you are under the penalty of death, but you fail to deliver the warning, they will die in their sins, and I will hold you responsible for their death. 19, if you warn them, and they refuse to repent and keep on sinning, they will die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself because you obeyed me. And verse 20, very important, let's see. Verse 20, see here. If righteous people turn away from their righteous behavior and ignore, their, ignore the obstacles I put in their way, they will die. And if you do not warn them, they will die in their sins. None of their righteous acts will be remembered, and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. It's pretty scary. God appointed him as a watchman. And he is holding him accountable. I will hold you responsible for their deaths if you don't give the message I am giving to you to tell them. Now verses 9, 18, 9, 19, you can see God, what I read earlier. God basically says, if you don't want the wicked man of his wicked ways, and he still stays in his wickedness, it's okay, he's, he's, he's going to die for his wickedness. But the thing is, but I am going to hold you responsible for not warning them. As you see, Ezekiel was not responsible for the righteousness of the wickedness of the people, but Ezekiel was just responsible for his own relationship with God to do what God told him to do. Talking of uh, responsibility, it's common for us to say, right, the sin is not my problem because I did sin because of something else. And uh, there are two, you know, first one, you know, first one you see here, every person is accountable to God for his own life. That's what we read in Ezekiel 3, you know, 18, 19, and 20, we saw that. Romans 14, 12 says this, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. God wants every single one of us to take responsibility for our own sin. But we have a good news that he has provided a way through Jesus for us. He wants us to take responsibility for it by confessing our sin and then receive from him the free gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because Romans 6.23 says, 
for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In this, Ezekiel was just a messenger. But we are living in the time of grace. Jesus took our punishment, paid in full. And another good news is that, you know, no one is responsible for the sins of his parents. A lot of people who believe that they are destined to repeat the sins of their parents are, the very least, they think they are defined by the sins of their parents. And uh, now the, the, the chapter uh, 18 starts with like this. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And God says, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. Because it is a common understanding in Israel, you know, if, if you read the story, you know, you can understand most of the Israelites were blaming their suffering or even their sinful nature was because of their parents, because of their forefathers, what they did. And, uh, you know, as God is teaching this one to, you know, to, to, to Ezekiel, who is in, you know, Babylon, at the same time, exactly the same thing in Jeremiah, God is teaching, you know, God is telling Jeremiah to teach to the people in Judah. You can see here Jeremiah 31, 29. In those days, people will no longer say, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. Meaning that the teeth are set on edge means the, the, the outcome of the sourness you will feel, right? The, 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 the sons are feeling the sourness, but the grapes were eaten by the forefathers. So exactly the same time, God is communicating through Jeremiah to the people in Judah and uh, through Ezekiel, he is teaching the people in Jerusalem. Because they have this nature, because when it goes back to Exodus 20, no, that is a reason possibly they, know they, they may be going back there. It says, no, for I am the Lord your God, I am jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those, you know, sometimes they forget, of those who hate me. And also it says, showing love to thousand generations of those who love me. I think the context is taken out, completely different, because Jewish community, pretty much they two or three generations lives under the same roof. And because of the sin of the father, it may impact the family itself. Because they may change the environment that may cause them to do the sinning. That is for true, right? Because one law, one government brings it in. If that law is going to exist for generations, you know how much it impacted the generations? But no, even, even Deuteronomy you know, clearly calls it out, Deuteronomy 24, 16, parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their children. Each will die for their own sin. Meaning, there is no generational curses, generational sins. You are responsible for your sin. Moses himself made it very clear. I think very important to the modern day, uh, you know, meaning of generational curses. We need to stop saying that, you know, in that, that context. And also, the 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the world has gone, the new is here. We're no longer responsible for the sins of our forefathers or parents or for anybody for that matter. And uh, next slide, yeah, the same slide. Ezekiel 18.4, for, you know, God says, for everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child, both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. And King James Version, you know, 20, specifically quoted here, this very well-known verse, 
right? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. So the, also, you know, if, if you look at it, I think, you uh, know, uh, 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 Ezekiel 18, verse 5 to, 5 to 19, you know, God, th that's a very elaborate, you know, the, if you read it, you know, it says about the sins of the father, one man, then it talks about the, you know, he, he, you, know you know, you have a righteous father, the, the one on the top, the righteous father, he does all good things, he didn't do a lot of sins, the Bible lists all those sins. And then it will tell he has got a son. That son is an evil son. He does all this evil. Then, and then Ezekiel puts the next one. He says, grandson, he is, you know, he is, you know, he, he is not like his father. So it's all these three sequences are mentioned. And, you know, you have a righteous father. You have an you know, unrighteous son and a righteous grandson. All these three, three things are listed. In, if you look at 18, 5 to 19 verses. And it clearly called out who will be punished, who will not be. I think for us the second birth is greater than the first. The spiritual birth is more dominant than the physical birth in Christ. The power of our spiritual heritage is greater than the influence of our natural parentage. Ezekiel wants us to know is that sinners need to be concerned about one thing and that is death. Because this chapter is a warning from God to every sinner of the impending reality of eternal death. That's what in one, sec in one sentence it calls, the soul that sinneth dies. Not just physically, spiritually and eternally. We are all dead you know, in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 says, you know, we are children of wrath. We are in fact the walking dead, headed for a judgment. And the Bible looks deeply into the human condition and it tells us that every part of us is sinful, wicked, and corrupt. The heart is evil. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Because human beings are wretched in our heart. I think that's why it's very important you now as you hear the message from most of the churches, death part mostly not spoken. That's the reason I think you know, sinners are defensive about their goodness also, right? They try to blame, they try to play the blame, blame game. You now blame it on the parents and blame it on, on, on the government, blame it on the party. It all happened, you know, even in, even in, in the Garden of Eden. You know, Genesis 3.12, what did Adam say when God asked him, why did he eat the fruit? What, whom did he blame? Whom did Adam blame? Blame? Eve or God? God, right? It was a woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it, right? This is the default position for all sinners. They don't want to accept the full responsibility for their richness. Now, the standard defense for proud sinners is they are not going to accept the bi biblical diagnosis of themselves. It's always been that way. Now, if they are going to blame their circumstances, they are going to blame the influences around them, the family, the people in the culture, people in previous cultures, and ultimately they are going to blame God, like how Adam did. That's the basic thing from atheists, right? If God created everything, God created these things, and, and, and God created sin, and I'm doing the sin, you know, all kinds of you know, theses and theologies, right? There is a human condition, there is a default position is not to accept their sin and, and going around it. I think we are all influenced by the evil around us and that, you know, that affects the you know, world in which we, have, we are living. 
I think when it comes to judgment, our judgment is going to be, you know, predicated only on our lives. And uh, message from Ezekiel is this. You are going to be judged. You are going to be judged by a life of true righteousness that con you know, continued and remained to the end. Or you are going to be judged by the life of sin that manifested you know, itself to the end. You are going to be judged on those two things. But we are saved by grace through faith. But we are going to be judged by our life works. The person who is righteous, God says, will live. The person who has been made righteous by God will live because he did righteous deeds. The person whose sins will die because those sins manifest the wretchedness of his own nature. Ezekiel 18.30, Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways. Ezekiel 18.30, Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. 31. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. What Ezekiel is saying is that we need to repent. We need to turn. We need to observe God's law, practice God's law. He is offering the salvation, forgiveness, mercy, grace. Now we see their responses. I think uh, you know, in verse 25, uh, now yet you say the Lord isn't doing what is right. Listen to me, O people of Israel. I, am, I, am I the one not doing what's right? Is it you? Also, we see God doesn't have any pleasure in the death of the wicked. He has pleasure in the death of the saints. I mean, we see that in Psalm 116, 15. Now, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the faithful servants. Very contradictory to the, our human nature, right? He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but sin will be punished. It's God's desire that you live, that you turn from your ways and live. That's a Christian message there. And Ezekiel 33, 11, Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, the same message repeated, but it, it, it just a little more punch there. You can see here, Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, as you as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Three times you see here. Turn. Why will you die, people of Israel? Here God himself, through prophet Ezekiel, pleading, pleading with these people to recognize that they are sinners. That they are wrong. It is hard for sinners to, to accept that reality. God has to draw them closer. I think you know, just coming to him and to submit themselves and God does the rest of the part. That is what you can see here and uh, you know, that the verse 31. Get a new heart and a new spirit. Read yourselves all the offenses, you get a new heart and a new spirit. God will do what the sinners cannot do. And the uh, same thing, you know, uh, Ezekiel 11, 19, exactly similar thing, which you know, I'll read it for you that will give a better understanding. And I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. I will. And I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them the heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people and I shall be their God. Because sinner cannot do. God has to do that. That work, I think that's a work which we call 
the work that was done on the cross. Because of what God has done in the cross, that we have that privilege to submit ourselves to him so that we get a new heart and he seals us with a new spirit. And in a beautiful language in Ezekiel 36, you know, well, uh, I'll read it for you, Ezekiel 36, 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your in impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, once again here, right? I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you heart of flesh again here. And I will put my spirit in you and, and move you to follow my decrees and be careful. Now that's important. And be careful to keep my law. I think the sinner is driven to the end of himself and has no power to do what he is commanded to do. It is at that point in the sinner's favor and in the sinner's relief that God steps in and that's what the sinner can never do. Come to me, repent, and live. This is the gospel message that we must now preach to everyone. That is what Ezekiel was asked to do, and God was holding him accountable. And uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Okay, next slide. Uh, now, our, uh, you see here, C.S. Lewis puts it this way, our desire is not only to see glory, we started with the glory of God. It's not just to have the claims of glory, not to read the glimpse of glory, but to participate in the glory we see. To participate in the glory we see. I think if you are not a believer today, we need that protection from the judgment that will be death, eternal death. Repent of your sin, accept the righteous, accept the righteous Savior who has taken on his your punishment of your sin. And if you are a believer, a Christian is not a man who never goes wrong, but a man who is enabled to to repent. It's once again C.S. Lewis, I like this quote. You know, a Christian is not a man who never goes wrong, but a man who is enabled to repent. Repent. I think we you know, even after we walk in the Lord after salvation, but sin tempts us, right? Jude 24, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence. Once again, he hears in a glorious presence without fault and with great joy. God will help us to keep us from stumbling, to present ourselves before his glorious presence. That glorious presence we got a glimpse earlier. I think, uh, once again, I just wanted to close this with the, you know, Ezekiel 11, 19. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. And uh, as Ezekiel was reaching out to the Lord, when, when, you know, when God talked to him, he asked him to stand up and listen. As we close this service, I would like all of you to stand up and how God spoke to Ezekiel, asked him to give his message to you personally, what it means to you to repent, whether either you are a believer or not a believer. Please stand up and ask God to speak to you. You will repent and you will live when you believe him. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. 2,500 years ago, you spoke to Ezekiel, asked him to stand up and asked him to listen, and you spoke to him. You appointed him as a watchman. 
and you gave the message to him to give the message to his people. I pray, Lord, at this time we all stand before you to listen to you. Speak to us, Lord. Speak to each and every one of us here today so that we will repent of our sins. Help us, Lord, to believe you so that we will live a life to see the glimpse of your throne, the wonderful glory that we will be able to participate in one day. We submit at your feet, at your throne. Help us, Lord, to come to you completely surrendering ourselves to you. Bless each and every one of us here. Take care of us, Lord. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I will close it with the benediction. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in peace.